Okay. Okay, let's so go. So we have we have begun. So this is the game of impossible podcast. For now, it might change at some point, but for now this is what we're going with. And uh, you know, maybe that would you like to give a bit of context uh, before we continue of, you know, a little bit about what you do. Um, yeah, I work I work in Shell for 23 years, you know, that I was in London and Sri Lanka and Holland. After the 23 years, I then then went to become the CEO of Malaysia Airlines to turn it around. It was a fantastic role that I played, and after that, then I got called to become a minister in the government. Uh, six years I served as a minister in charge of transformation, economic and also government transformation. After that, then I then started my own consultancy. We've been on the road doing consultancy now for fixing businesses as well as helping governments across the world. Our projects have now, over the last five years, run into something like 26 countries. I'm also currently the uh, chan uh, pro-chancellor for uh, Sunway University. I'm a co-chairman from Sunway Group, which is a Malaysian conglomerate covering 13 businesses. I'm also uh, chairman of Heineken Malaysia, and that's the, the kind of role I work, uh, work in right now. So how does a jungle boy, I mean, for, you know, for those listening, um, you know, my, my dad grew up in the jungles of, of Borneo. Uh, so how does a jungle boy um, begin to even envision, did you even envision doing what you're doing no, today? No, I, I had no idea that I would end up doing what I do. But all I knew is that all along the way, as, as I started to do my work, I only strive to set difficult targets, very tough targets. And they didn't call them the game, the impossible then. And the reason why I intuitively felt that was the right thing to do was, there was a story that my dad always kept on saying, you must strive for big targets, you know. And so that was a starting point. So everything I did, I just did the best I could in what I, what I was doing. And one thing led to another. I never planned to become a minister. I never planned to work for Shell as well. I never planned to become CEO of Malaysia Airlines. They came along the, along the path. I've worked now for more than tw 31 years, actually. Yeah. You know, you, you talked about not necessarily having the grand plan um, of, of what you intended to do. And I think the reason why we want to start this episode is because, you know, you are, you are writing a book yes, um, as we speak. The book is called The Game of the Impossible, Impossible, much like uh, the name of this podcast. Um, but where did, what was the first Game of the Impossible for you? If you say there wasn't a grand vision of what, what it would materialize to today, yeah. you said it was about just doing the best, uh, best of your abilities in whatever uh, was in front of you. What was that first instance of the Game of the Impossible, if it, you can remember? Yeah, it, of course, it, it started with my dad, because my father was a teacher, your, your grandpa was a teacher, and he taught me in the classroom. And when he got, we got home, he was continuing to teach me, so make sure I did my homework. But he said this, you know, son, if you want to be number one in the class, it, the game, the impossible was, Find out who is the best student in the class, be his or her, his or her best friend, know exactly what he does, and then do it, but make it to the power of 10. Mm. I mean, if that's really what he, he was talking about, taking extreme measures. And that was really the game, the impossible. So he said, even if you're number 20 in the class, in a very short period of time, if you do that, be a, a friend to the best student in class, and do more than that person does because you already know what he or she does, you will be able to be become the top student. That was what the starting point for me. And that was what I did in school, actually. My, my, the lesson learned was exactly that. And, and he said, uh, the word kiasu is a Hokkien word. Huh? Mm. It's now in the Oxford English Dictionary. <laughs> it means hate to lose. Mm. My dad used to say, in the clubbit language, there's an equivalent. It also begins with K, katwi. Katwi means burning desire to win. So whether you are kiasu, which we had to lose, very negative side of it, or you have a burning desire to win, which is a positive side, it doesn't matter which side of the coin you are, it means you're going to take extreme measures. That's what it is. People who do the game, the impossible, take extreme measures, which is, do what the guy who is top student in the class 
do it to the power of 10. That's extreme measures. And if you start doing that, in no time you become the best student in class. Who, who was that top student yeah, that the, you intended the, the, to beat? The, 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 the top student in class in primary one all the way with, together with me was Madan. <laughs> He's my, uh, my Madan. cousin, Uncle Madan. <laughs> he was a very good student. He was very studious. He was very attentive. He was a good student. So he, we and I became very good friends. <laughs> very, very good very friends. Strategic because, friendship. Yeah, strategic friendship. I think <laughs> I recall when we were young. Strategic friendship that became a real friendship. <laughs> and, and, and because I became his friend, he also became better. Yeah. at what he was doing. And so I recall we became very good friends. Uh, he, we and he and I were toe-to-toe. Uh, -to -toe. He was a good student and we both became really good at what we were doing. I suppose, um, yeah, that, that resonates a little bit with uh, why, why I wanted to start this podcast, actually. Why do you want to start it? So it's very similar to what you said. I mean, for me, it's less of stemming from a place of competition. Mm. But I think... The, what, what makes that theory of yours or that approach work yeah. is the fact that you are building proximity to the person mm. that is exuding yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, those qualities that you want uh, right. to, to mirror yourself. And I think growing up, I have often watched uh, what you have done from afar. Um, you know, naturally, a lot of that has, I believe, has, uh, has passed on to me. But I don't think I have uh, really been intentional mm. about truly wanting to learn you know yeah. so i think doing this is also a way of instituting uh, you know a, a weekly check-in to be able yeah. to sit down and to do yeah. the katui thing yeah. and to 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 learn uh, from you as well you know I, i've often wanted to not be so closely associated with you mm. but i think the older <laughs> i get the more i see uh, the value in doing that actually on a very you know, on a selfish level even if it's not of value to whoever right. may or may not be listening to this uh, at least it's something that i can always look back on and say yeah. i have learned uh, sure. from doing this so you know that okay. is actually the the main reason why uh, i want to do uh, this podcast but the other thing is you know i think i have put off the idea of doing a podcast for a long time. It's been mm. something that's been on my mind, mm. but I put it off because I couldn't quite find a compelling um, why for it. What would be a compelling purpose for doing this, which would then allow me to uh, do the thing consistently? I think my challenge sometimes, while we're talking about the game of the impossible is, you know, naturally I like to pursue the game of the impossible, but I've realized my habit is that in wanting to pursue that, I usually tend to do or pursue very big things, big things, and then I achieve those big things, but after a while, that effort is not uh, sustained. Uh -huh. So in the long run, there's a lot of accomplishments and achievements, yeah. but then before yeah. they can amount to something even greater, yeah. I, I jump off. Yeah. I mean, a big, a good example, a recent example is, you know, training for, uh, training for the marathon mm -hmm. uh, that myself and, uh, you know, Ryan, yeah, uh, yeah. Ryan, uh, my, my cousin and, and, and my uncle, Adam, three of us trained for a marathon. That was a game of the impossible yeah. for the three of us. Because and I've never done a marathon, <laughs> so I really salute you for doing it. <laughs> so that was a game of the impossible for the three of us. And you know, I mean, long story short, we, 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 completed, we yeah. completed the marathon. That's fantastic, you know. Leon, considering the fact you had first marathon and you did it. Yes. And a lot of people do it the first time round, they didn't complete it, but both Correct. you, you, you did it. Correct. But you see, I did it. Yeah. And then after I did yeah. it, then, I stopped yeah. running for yeah. a long time. Actually, one, one of the sessions we will, we will talk is about discipline of action. Yes. And we will cover not today, yeah. one of the subsequent weeks. That's a very important component. Yes. So while we talk about the game, the impossible, you must actually embrace discipline of action, Correct. which will take you through a much longer period that you can sustain it. Yeah. And that it doesn't just become a sprint. Correct. Then the marathon will continue. Yes. So back to the, compel the question of the compelling why for doing this podcast. I asked myself, well, what would I, how could I set up this podcast in a way that I could continue to do it and uh, not care so much about the outcome, but treat it as a discipline? Mm. And yeah. I think that was where I thought, you know what, maybe instead of me doing it as a podcast on my own, mm. what would be actually valuable to myself is doing this 
Yeah. Because regardless of whether this podcast does well, it means that at the very least, I have spent, you know, I've done a weekly check-in with you yeah. and it's been intentional. And even if yeah. nobody watches, <laughs> I can always look back and say, I'm very glad that we did this and cool. made, the, made the most out of however many more years yeah, you yeah. have. Uh, you know, on this on this earth, and so that yeah. was my reason for 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 That's starting good, right? this. Yeah. What is the game of the impossible looking like for you now? You are you've just begun a one year sabbatical. Yeah. Uh, so what what, what I, would the game of the impossible look like in this season for you? Um, I'm 65. I just turned 65 in August last year. I told the team about 10 years ago when I turned 65. I will resign from my work, rather retire. But I didn't anticipate then that COVID-19 was a period when two years of uh, interruption to the work. But nonetheless, I told the team this time round, that why don't we do a game of the impossible? I take a sabbatical, completely take a sabbatical this whole, uh, whole year. You guys run the show. You guys run the show. Don't involve me. Don't send me email. Don't get me into meetings. You guys just do, do it. And so... And that was the game, the impossible. So during this period, my wife and I, we, you know, your mom and I, we were really figuring out, why don't we do things that, we do things together. So this whole year, the game, the impossible is to discover what is this thing that she and I can do for the second half of our life. So the year of sabbatical is to find it. To discover we will discover many things but i think in one year we really think we will find the thing that we believe that it's fulfilling for both of us me and her and during this period of the uh, the sabbatical she's going to call the shots she has the authority to call the shots she will object to it the authority because in 31 years when i was working i was calling the shots and that was really unfair in many sense so when i left uh, Kuala Lumpur and we went to Holland she had to quit her job to follow me you know when we went to London for four years she had to quit her job to follow me so I was the the career person that led it but I mean this time around the, 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 the game the impossible we're going to discover there are many things that we will think we will discover along the way what are some things that you are doing right now well I decided I thought about many years ago I was very interested in Pheasants, <laughs> and so, and uh, I went to a niece wedding, and uh, <clears throat> where was it? Wolverhampton. That day, right? it was near Wolverhampton. Near Wolverhampton, yeah. and then I saw some pheasants being reared, and so uh, when we came down to London, you recall we came down to London. I ordered uh, some of those uh, pheasants, and uh, I ordered four of them. They, they came from Essex, delivered the following day, and. When we cooked them, I think it was so delicious. We call it soup trajun, and we put it inside the pot there, and I cooked the thing. It was the soup was almost golden color. Yeah. I would say that they are as good as kampong chicken to the power of ten. So from then on, I was really trying to look for where can I get the chicks and where can I get some hen, the, the female and the male, so I can start breeding that. So I then found someone who sells them. Last week I bought two uh, males one, and next week I will get 20 chicks, the small ones, from uh, all the way from Johor. And so right now as we speak, we, we are building the, uh, the, uh, the pheasant cage, 20 feet altogether, and so right now that's being built. Next week we'll start the project. And so I really want to that, get my hands involved in doing this game. I've never bred anything like that before. All I know is that pheasants were some things we used to shoot in the jungle. And, but now I'm trying to breed them. That's something completely different from what I do. How do you deal with coaching or guiding or mentoring people yeah. um, through this game of the impossible? For the game of the impossible, I've set three golden rules. And so that's how I will encourage people to come out from the comfort zone to do it. So I will tell them rule number one is we will set together with you, tell the person, impossible targets that you definitely cannot achieve based on your current way of doing it. But the first thing that the person has a problem with is that, wow, I'm destined to fail. So I won't do it. Then I will tell him, 
don't worry, we will also set realistic target. You will give you realistic target that you can achieve based on normal way of doing it. So if you do that, we're not going to punish you for not achieving the impossible target, but because you already have the first level of target, which is realistic target. But if you then pursue the next level, that is, we're going to reward you for doing that, but not punish you for not failing, not achieving it. So that's rule number one, deliberately set impossible target. The second rule, golden rule, is that because you set impossible target, it will force the person and the organization to innovate to find new ways of doing it. That is a very important thing. When you start innovating, finding a new way to do it, a change will happen, which comes to the third rule. Huh? The third golden rule is that when people who are involved in the game of the impossible and the organizations involved in the game of the impossible, the people and the organization over time will become transformed to get the version of themselves. So if I tell the person to convince them, this is my storyline. I will tell them rule number one, rule number two, and rule number three is, because of rule number three, you will get the best version of yourself. You will achieve your full potential. John Ruskin once said, the best reward for a man's toil is not what he gets from it, but what he becomes of it. And that means if you pursue the game, the impossible, you become the best version of yourself. And that is really what it is. So my encouragement to that person that I will try to encourage and coach is that I really want you to take this path so that you get the best version of yourself. And if you do that, you'll be surprised at the amount of the, the level of achievements that you can make because that's the best version of yourself in every pursuit that you take. Mm. Yeah, I, I like that idea about it's not so much about the, you know whether or not you achieve the thing, yeah. but it's actually what you, who you become, along the way, uh, and it's been something that I've been spending a lot of time thinking about, um, in, especially in the last two years. Uh, in the last two years, where I've been, um, you know, in in full time ministry, uh, so you know, I think just just to give uh, context to anybody who's listening. Um, Prior to prior to going into full time ministry, uh, you know I was working in advertising, uh, and then and then I was working uh, in Pamandu in your consultancy as well, um, and and doing very well. And then I just decided at some point it felt like I was there was a sense of calling um, into full time full time ministry, uh, full time ministry being full time church uh, ministry, um, and it was very funny because it was something that. You know, back to that quote about what we fear most mm -hmm. is probably what we need to do. Uh, I definitely feared that because it wasn't something that I necessarily wanted to do uh, on my own volition. Mm -hmm. uh, on paper, there were a lot of things that are unattractive about working for church. You know, a very obvious one is salary. So I took a big salary cut um, mm -hmm. to to go and you know be a be a pastor, um, but also. You know, um, I think if you put a lot of value in what you do, which is you know, which was and continues to be the case for me, mm. uh, not having, not being able to say, oh, I, I, I you know, I, I, I hold, I, I do this job or I hold this title, uh, something that would easily open up conversations, losing, losing that, it felt like a, a big thing to give up, mm. uh, You know, mm. because it's, I mean, mm. today if I, if I am at a wedding or dinner party and I'm meeting new people, uh, usually the conversation sort of comes to an end once they find out, oh, okay, you, you work for church, and you become a little less interesting. Um, so there were a lot of reasons why I didn't want to do it. Uh, but nonetheless, I, I figured, you know, I, as I prayed, that it, that was exactly the reason why um, I was supposed to do it. But then I think a few about a year in is when it really started to hit me that actually um, if I, if I change my, my, my thinking about it and not to think so much about what can I achieve, mm. but actually what is this, what am I supposed to learn, who am I supposed to become uh, in this journey of being uh, in full-time ministry, then that, that gave me a lot of reasons to enjoy the job. Uh, you know, I wasn't growing exponentially in terms of right. hard skills, 
but actually indirectly I realised I was learning so much about how to become a better leader uh, re- a lot of character formation now I realise those things are completely transferable mm, yeah. to to corporate work sure. uh, because there's a lot of these practices which Absolutely. you know you, you, you just apply in a different context naturally that 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 focusing on the being naturally informs the doing um, yeah. so that's something I've been thinking a lot about la. Um, actually from a point about st- in this case not even so much about who you become along the way but actually what do you want to become first mm. before pursuing whatever mm. that game of the impossible is sure. did you know when I ask you to become the interim chairman during my sabbatical for Pomandu, you, you are now the interim chairman you realize that the that's part of the game, the impossible. Yes. I wanted you to step into the shoes, my shoes, for one whole year so that you will also begin to do that. And another thing that I wanted to do, and that basically is unconventional, doing the thing that not, not many people do. Mm. You haven't spent a lot of time in Pamandu Associate, yeah. very little time, but I already, because this is now new way of working, it will force you to innovate. In many sense, the other, most people will appoint one CEO. But what I did unconventionally was I appointed now joint managing directors uh, to run the show at this time. And so this is very unconventional. Most people have there's only one managing director, but to put two people, I realized that you have to find unconventional ways to do it, innovate how to do it. So the key here is that if we do this, Aida and Rizwan will discover very different ways of working because now they have to work together they are finding ways to do it i'm confident that getting the best out of people you have to find different ways not the conventional ways to do it i'm very sure leon in the next one year or so you will discover many things you will discover many things that you never thought you could do and during that one year so that's your game the impossible and i'm confident you will do it actually mm. yeah partly why i you know the added impetus for doing this yeah. uh, podcast is is actually because of that yeah. because uh, you know to be very honest with you when you first told me <laughs> that you wanted me to 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 take over as interim chair i remember my instant answer yeah. within yeah. seconds was yeah. no no i remember <laughs> why would you want me to why would you want me to do that uh, i even said maybe mum would be a better mm. a better person to do this but you know after a while i again that same thought process of I, I fear it and therefore that that is probably the, the indicator that this is a game of the impossible that I should pursue um, and then going back on that thesis of then okay if that's the game of the impossible you want to pursue how do you become that person and so this is actually my way of building a bit more intentional proximity uh, mm. with you to think well how have you done it how can I become a little bit more uh, like you um, and from there, you know, be a bit more programmed then to make decisions uh, maybe that are a bit more in line with how you would think. Maybe it's a good time to segue into examples of other people uh, mm. that have yep. really pursued this game, the impossible. Closer to home, when I was CEO of Malaysia Alliance and I was on the board of Ayata, and um, once a year, all those folks in Ayata, the CEOs, the, the, we gather in one location and we invite a speaker. We invited Lee Kuan Yew, and he was there. So we invited him to speak. Uh, it was incredible. He talked about this idea of creating Singapore to where it is today when they actually had no hope. If you go to YouTube, you'll find that he actually did cry. And so there was a question asked of him. Why did you cry when Malaysia kicked you out from the Federation of, from Malaysia at that time? And, uh, and what, what did you do the very next day? And this was a story he said. That was the 9th of August, 1965. That was the day Singapore got out from, from Malaysia. He gathered all his friends, the other ministers together, he told them we have two choices. One is we leave because we have no hope, we have no natural resources, we have nothing really here, and as a country, give up. The other one is stay put here, and he had one idea of the game that is impossible. We make Singapore, he said, 
a hub for logistics, a hub for finance, a hub for trade. We make Singapore that. That was it. And so he asked everybody in the room, how many of you want to quit and leave, migrate elsewhere, put up your hands? Nobody did. Then he said, how many of you will stick with me to pursue this game, the impossible? We create a thriving hub for the whole of the region in Singapore because it's strategically located. And so all of them put up their hands. That was a starting point how the nation of Singapore became what it is today. I mean, considering the fact that they have zero, not a single molecule drop of oil and gas, it's the biggest oil trading country in ASEAN. Not Malaysia, not Indonesia. Mm. Massive, biggest petrochemical complex. Huge port, that, lots of trade that they're doing. So if you like, they have really made it fantastic. Changi is an air transport hub. They are a financial services hub. So in many sense, he pursued the game, the impossible. It was interesting that at that session, he then asked the question, do you guys have any more questions? There was one CEO of um, Maldives. He said, uh, Mauritius rather. He said, I'm from Mauritius. Can you give me advice? How we in Mauritius can copy what you guys have done? in Singapore, so that we become a hub. And his response was quite shocking. He said, young man, you have no hope. <laughs> you will never be able to achieve this. The reason why you have no hope is that the reality is today is we were successful as a hub because ASEAN prospered. Mm. That's our hinterland. But in your case, I don't see in my lifetime how Africa will get their act together. So the question for you in Mauritius is, hub for whom? Yeah. So you have to understand certain elements, context where you're trying to do it. So if I created something that is, if I'm in the Maldives and I wanted to become a hub in the Mauritius, and I would not succeed as well. So you have to look at the context as well. And so uh, it was, he was very robust. And... Uh, so he turned to the young man, he said, uh, I'm not saying you have no hope because you are hopeless, or you are no good. It's just that you happen to sit there in a position where you can't be hub simply because Africa, in my lifetime, in my view, he said, they're never going to the act, get the act together. But if you want to be a tourist destination, for sure you can. And you have to choose your battles well. And so then he looked around the rest of us and then he said, any question, everyone looked the head, not the head down. Because he was a very robust guy in answering the question. That was Lee Kuan Yew. There are many other examples actually that, to me, close to home here in, in Malaysia, no one would have imagined Singapore today as it is, in the year 1965, that it will turn out to be what it is today. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. So in this case, sometimes your, your context yeah. is also a precursor for whether or not you will be able to achieve Succeed, the impossible. Yeah. So if we, let's, let's, let's take a workplace yeah. example. So not, not a nation or not, uh, not a region, but now let's say you have been put into maybe a, a role and it's not a team that you have built. Uh, but it's a team that you've inherited mm -hmm. or yeah a team that you've inherited and let's say maybe the conditions within uh within this uh, uh, organization whether it's your immediate team or just the the culture at large uh, isn't conducive to transformation how then do you pursue mm -hmm. the game of the impossible in that context yeah i i, I did actually go through exactly that in uh, shell middle distillers i was working in london at that time the shell said idris you come back to malaysia you become the managing director of Shell Middle Distillers. We have a plant in Bintulu, lost money for 10 straight years. Go and fix it. That was really what it is. So I remember first day I turned up at the work, everyone in that company were defeated. They kind of said, it's impossible to fix this company. It's a pilot plan. There are no precedents anywhere on earth where such a business had thrived because we were the first company in the oil and gas industry in the world that started to get diesel or kerosene from natural gas because diesel and kerosene come from 
crude oil. And so because we were the first gas to liquids, gas to liquids business, and, and lost money for 10 straight years, and there was nowhere else we could learn from in order to succeed. And so it was a company was so defeated. So to your point, that was exactly what I felt. So I turned, I brought everybody down in a room and I said to them, look, let's pursue this game, the impossible. What it means is that we can put a target that within one year we'll make profits and the subsequent years we'll make record profits. Of, of course, nobody believed me, but I did tell them because we know that the current way of doing it, it's impossible to achieve it, we will have to find new ways how to do it entirely new ways how to do it. And so that was the starting point. We went out to do many, many different things we've never done before completely. We'll not have the time to go and go to so much detail. In the first six months, we made 10 million net profit after tax. The second year, we already made 260 million net profit after tax. The third year, I think we made close to 500 million net profit after tax. It's a company that lost money for 10 straight years and everyone was defeated. But we could find a way to use exactly the same people to turn it around. By the way, when I turned up, I was the only guy that's new. Everyone, the entire teams were inherited. They were people who were existing there. I brought no one along with me from outside, worked with the same people that were defeated, and that was how we started to do them. So it is possible in my view. And that's a one clear example of what we did. I mean, I wanted to make sure that everyone knew that we were making money. So when we first made our first profit in, uh, it was December 2003. That was the first time we made 10 million net profit after tax. You may remember at that time, Apple had just released iPod. It was the object of desire, everyone wanted that. And I had 300 over staff. I remember going out to all the stores and asking Apple that I wanted to buy all 300 that was available because I wanted to give everybody in the company an iPod because it was the object of desire, including our tea lady, including the, uh, the security guard, everybody had it because I wanted to tell everybody we have arrived. To your point, I wanted to tell them we are now on a cusp of becoming an a, a winning team. It was a team that for 10 years, it was defeated. For 10 years, they were defeated and had no hope. It was a team that felt that we could do many, many things. So in the second year, it was no surprise that we were able to make 265 million net profit of the tax. You know, we, we like sport, yeah. both of us. And uh, <laughs> since you, you, know, you, you were talking about um, other people's examples of pursuing the game of the impossible, uh, who is an ex who is an example that maybe comes to mind uh, from an athletic point of view? There are two, but I'll mention one. One is uh, Carl Lewis that I know, and uh, and the other one, Usain Bolt. We all know Usain Bolt. We invited Usain Bolt. He came to Kuala Lumpur for a Kuala Lumpur Leadership Conference, Transformation Conference. It was in 2017. The Global Transformation Forum. The Global Forum. Transformation Forum, that's uh, correct. Which was in, in itself a bit of a game of the impossible yeah, yeah. for so, Pamandu, <laughs> yeah. uh, who is so when not an events company, but yeah. ran a very, very successful, high-caliber yeah. um, transformation uh, conference. That was it, and really, and, um, so he set for himself this game, the impossible. He wanted to be the fastest runner on earth, breaking the, the world record many times over and that it will stand for a very, very long time, that people will find that very, very difficult to, uh, to beat. And so that was what he set out to do. That was the game, the impossible. Most of us think that uh, the guy is a boisterous looking fellow, because when you see him on television, he does this. Uh, actually, when we had dinner with him that evening, he was a very quiet, soft-spoken guy. And the very next day during the conference, there was a question asked of him in the public. Mr. Bolt, what's going on in your mind when you are at a starting block of 100 meters? And his response was quite shocking as well. He said, I'm only thinking of what I'm going to eat tonight. <laughs> and the question is, why not? I mean, if you had won it, surely you can't be thinking of food. Yeah. And the reason is this. 
nine months prior to every race, his diet is regimented. That sacrifice that he had to make. His diet is totally regimented because of the game, the impossible, and his exercise regime is completely regimented. And his sleep pattern is completely mm. regimented. He must sleep every night prior to 9 p.m. And he needs to have the sleep because otherwise he cannot recover in time for the next you know, training session. So this is very, very tough. That means taking extreme measures in diet, in exercise, as well as uh, sleep and rest. So that's how he was able to then do it. And so this is very, very important. So it's a fantastic example of what, what you can do. Carl Lewis is another example. We invited Carl Lewis to the same sort of forum a year before. And his game, the impossible was, he wanted to be the next Jesse Owen. And when he said that, he said he will beat Jesse Owen's uh, Olympics target, he didn't realize that he was talking to Newsweek. I can't remember within Newsweek or Time, but what had turned out was they put his photograph on the front page of the magazine, the next Jesse Owen. And he was not prepared for them to put it like that because it was already put on the front page that he said, this man dares to beat Jesse Owen's rec world record and he will be the fastest man on earth. He had no choice, so he became completely pregnant and he had no choice to pursue it much the same way as, uh, as, as, as Usain Bolt in dieting, in, in his exercise regime. Can you explain what you mean you know, for, for those who don't uh, understand yeah. for context, when yeah. you, you have a phrase that you use in the organization as well about being pregnant. pregnant. Right? Ah. What, what do you, <laughs> before you continue, what, do you, what does that mean for yeah. people who it, might be wondering? It means this, you must, if you declare an impossible target publicly and you tell the whole world that is what you are going to achieve, you become pregnant. When you're pregnant, there's only one consequence. You have to deliver. You can't keep the baby beyond nine months. You must deliver. So by being pregnant, by announcing it publicly, and that you're now telling the whole world that you are now going to pursue this game, the impossible, you become completely pregnant. Mm. You've got no choice but to deliver. So that's basically what Carl Lewis really did. So in a sense, when you start doing this, this act of doing, pursuing the game, the impossible, finding new ways how to do it, which is dieting, changing the way you diet, getting the best exercise regime, getting the best people that coach you and do that. That's how you can achieve it. Mm. Going back to the Usain Bolt thing, uh, this is something that I didn't quite, uh, you know, you shared this story with me before, but I know as you're sharing it this time around, something occurred to me mm. as well about why would he be thinking about the meal that he's going to eat uh, at such a <laughs> high pressure event, surely you would be focused on, you know, some people believe in visualizing. How is it that he is able to be in a frame of mind <laughs> when the whole world is watching and so much is at stake where all he's thinking about <laughs> is food? But then something occurred to me and it's, you know, there's, there's so much preparation yeah. that goes into yeah. the nine months Correct. prior. Yeah. And actually when you, um, and this is something you talk a lot about yeah. as well, um, the, 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 the importance of preparation. Yeah. But actually, there's something very freeing when you are so prepared for something that when it comes to doing the thing, you're not having to think so much or worry because you know you've put in the work Absolutely. already. And that now gives you yeah. the freedom to, <laughs> to it, think it, about it's food, very true. perhaps. It, it's you know, very true. I experienced that when, yeah. um, you know, whether it's, whether it's giving, uh, giving a, a sermon at mm. church, but I think the most, for me, where it probably plays up the most uh, is, you know, part of what I do in church. This is not part of my full-time mm. role, but as a volunteer, I serve on the worship team. Um, so we, you know, you know lead, leading worship is something that I do uh, on, on Sundays. And I find that when I am, when I am very prepared, um, you know, both practically, but also spiritually, when I have put in the work to really prepare, then I'm able to lead worship in a way where it's no longer just about thinking about mm. the music but you are now able to then have another eye to look out for what's, Some other what's things. the sense yeah. what is God doing in the room yeah, yeah. and if sometimes that means 
you know, the Holy Spirit convicting you to either change a song or do something a little bit different. Mm. Uh, it, it frees you up to be aware of that and to now think, okay, I'm very familiar with the song and therefore I know how to, I know how to divert in a way that still makes sense because I've, I've prepared. Yeah, I'm yeah. no longer stressed about the set, but I'm free to make changes. I'm also free to be able to think about and care for the, the team around me yeah, and to yeah. know how to communicate in the moment with yeah. them uh, in a way that is clear. And yeah. that's only possible with preparation because yeah, there have absolutely. been days where maybe I have not prepared so much, whether it's been not prepared musically or maybe not prepared um, by readying myself spiritually, mm. where I can, you can find yourself you know, thinking a lot just about the, the, the technicality. And while the music, there may not be any errors in the way that we have sang or played the music, if you think, well, what was the, what, what did we, did we manage to achieve, um, you know, people encountering God? You know, I, 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 would, I would dare say that there have been times where I've led worship where actually there, it was no different than just a concert. Yeah, yeah, know, yeah. The music was there, but yeah, actually, yeah how were we facilitating an encounter with God? Uh, maybe that would have been inhibited through my lack of preparation. Mm. You to point, someone once said, to fail to prepare is to prepare to fail. That's very, very true. And I, I relate the story about Nishan is my colleague of mine, and I have this rule. We must prepare for every big thing that we do when we are preparing for the Global Transformation Forum. There was three months of preparation in great detail. We call it three feet preparation. We know exactly to the T, minute by minute, what we're going to do, who we're going to, how we're going to get everything done. But I always tell the team, the day we're going to do it, no more new instructions. I don't go and give any more instructions to Nishan and the team on what to do it because we've done enough. So I just turn up there Guys, no more sitting around, no more new instructions. We've already done it many times before. We just relax and breathe. Relax. So that's what we normally do. It was the same thing I normally do when I was in studying in, in, in university, when I was in USM. All of my friends will remember me that I used to go and walk around just the, the day before the exams, walking around to disturb people in the library because I've done all the preparation already. So I, I'm done already. So I don't, I don't study last minute. I've already done it. So the day before, I just walk around, relax. There's nothing you can do. It's already done three months. So in the same way, when I was doing my thesis, I finished my thesis two weeks before everybody else. And I submitted my thesis so I can walk around. So I think this idea of preparing is very important. You know, I have this habit of every meeting, I'm always early. Because it's the same Except thing. Except for one. Yeah. There was one meeting. <laughs> I have to put this on record just because it was so odd that it happened. And the fact that it happened, we, everybody got worried yeah, and yeah. thought there was something, something wrong. Uh, something wrong. Yeah. Which was uh, at just, a, I think it was uh, last, it was just a few days ago. Uh -huh. we, had a, we had a board meeting to, to discuss a, a particular ag important yeah. agenda item. Yeah. And you are usually... When you say early, I mean, you are very early, very early. Like, you know, at, at least maybe at the very least 10 minutes yeah. uh, prior to yeah. the, the meeting. Even if it's on yeah. Zoom, you've already opened already. the Zoom room. <laughs> but this was one time for my, and as long as I have, you know, worked <laughs> with you, one time you were, you were a little bit, not, you weren't just on time because yeah. for you on time is late, but yeah. you, were, you were maybe one or two minutes late. Yeah, what, what happened there? Yeah, that, that's the thing. Like, when you are caught with some other people mm. asking too many questions in another meeting. Yeah. And so I was dragged into all the discussion. So they were asking so many questions and I really got caught into the act. The act. By the time we came back and then we, we had a traffic jam as well coming back. So I had no provision for the traffic jam. By the time I came here, I was, I was a fraction late. But I think this point about, as you said, you must prepare. Returning back to the Usain Bolt story, he's over-prepared. So when it comes to the time, relax. So you should prepare well in advance, so when it comes right to the event, there's nothing you can do to improve it because you've done everything you, you are going to do. I think that's always my approach when I'm leading a team. 
I get someone in charge. I don't come any anywhere telling them, can you change the light, can you do that? Don't do any more of that. I think you're only going to panic people for new requests, new additions. Don't do that. You want to have everybody that's come so that you become like Ocean Ball. You're only thinking about what you're going to eat tonight. The race is the race. Your body is ready for that, but everything else is relaxed. Do you maybe have uh, some practical advice then for how do you how do you prepare, and then how do you know when you have prepared enough? I would say this: the first practical tips to pursue the game, the impossible, is that you stand in in the future and visualize yourself in that future. To your point before, imagine what you want to become. Uh, in business, the richest man in the world today, Jeff Bezos, when he started to do Amazon, he declared to the whole world that he was going to be the biggest bookstore in the world. That was, he, you need to visualize the future, stand in the future, and manage the present from the future. So that's practical step number one. The practical tip number two is to conquer the fear of failure. How do you conquer the fear of failure? You must have a conversation with your boss and tell the boss, we're going to put a target that you and I say I cannot achieve. And so I will ask you as my boss, is this target possible to achieve? And he will definitely say it cannot be achieved. Then he said, okay, since you say it cannot be achieved, I ask you a second question. Is it worthwhile to go for it, although it cannot be achieved? Then the answer from the boss will be, yes, it's worthwhile. And the third conclusion that you then say to the boss, boss, since you say it's impossible to achieve, but you say it's worthwhile to go for it, and if I fail, it's okay, isn't it? Surely the answer is, it's okay. So because of that, you then conquer the fear of failure. I call it a conversation leading to a conclusion where your boss says, it's okay for you to fail. That is the way you conquer the fear of failure. Because the boss already said, it's impossible to achieve, but it's worthwhile for you to do it. And if you don't, if you don't achieve, it's okay. But the realistic target is, of course, we will then hold you accountable for that. But I'm not going to hold you accountable for the game, the, for the game, the impossible, because it is impossible to achieve any. That's the practical tip number two. The th third practical tip, and as you achieve that, the subsequent years keep pushing the targets upward. Don't stay put where you are before, because if you stay put, that becomes normal. So to the point that you, when you mention the marathon, keep on putting a new target. But don't say you've done it and therefore I don't want to do it. So you now set up a new target. Run the, consider running the, the London Marathon, consider running the Boston Marathon, set new, keep pushing it. That is step number three. Step number four, which is the practical tip number four, is critically challenge your current thinking and assumptions. This is the reason why we never innovate because our current thinking is the one that tells us do it that way and cannot do it any other way. So you must always currently really must change the way in which you do it. In the, our example of Shell Middle Distillates, if we sell kerosene as pure kerosene, we would not have made money. So what was the thing that we did was we started to sell kerosene as a barbecue lighter. And we started to sell as barbecue lighter and we could mark up the price much higher than, than kerosene. In fact, we found out that uh, our drilling, uh, our, our diesel, if we sell as diesel, we don't make as much money. But we found that if we sell our diesel as drilling fluid, the margins double. And obviously, that's the current assumption is you think of selling diesel as fuel. You will never make so much money if you sell kerosene, it's just kerosene. You don't make as much money. The current thinking was, why don't we just think about a new application? So in the year 2003, we also challenged ourselves. Why don't we go and make a brand for ourselves, compete with all the refineries in Europe, and become the official supplier for green diesel at the Athens Olympics? That's total changing our mindset. So we told the team, why don't we bid? together with the Shell Group, 
we bid and make sure that we become the official supplier for green diesel at the Athens, Athens Olympics. You know what most people say, Leon? Impossible. Why did they say impossible? Because we have to ship our diesel all the way from Bitulu, all the way to Athens, to compete with all the refineries in Europe who also have diesel. They said it's impossible, we have to ship, pay for insurance, we cannot beat them. But you know what? We won it. We were the official supplier for green diesel at the Athens Olympics in 2003. And because of that, we were well known. We got the brand, the global recognition. And when we were selling our product in Germany, Gerhard Schroeder, who was the chancellor for Germany, was even prepared to come down to the Shell station in Germany to declare sale for our product because we then got a front seat in terms of uh, branding. So that's practical tip number four. So practical tip number five is when you have set out this journey, you must harness the entire resource people in your team through a lab. And so we usually get the best, the marketing people, the sales people, the IT people, the HR people, and um, operations folks come together in the room and say, this is the game, the impossible. Can you all work together as a team in the next six weeks? You drop out your normal activities. Together, how do you achieve this game, the impossible? Singularly, they cannot do it. Its team cannot do it. But the power of putting everybody in a multidisciplinary fashion and give them a time box, six weeks to do it. It's incredible. I always tell people, we are at the best when we have our backs against the wall. And that's how people innovate. You don't innovate if you are telling them you're going to sit here for you know prolonged period of time without any pressure. Billy Jean King once said, pressure is privilege. So I tell my team, why don't we give you six weeks in a lab, time box, and you are working full time on it, that's how we harness the best talents. So when I use the word unleashing talents, in my mind, for the game of the impossible, in my mind, the practical tip is run a lab, multidisciplinary. And that is, to me, is a very practical approach to unleashing talents. People use the word unleashing talents in a very figurative sense. But the question is, how do you do it? Running a lab, putting them inside the room, locking them there all together for six weeks and call it Hotel California. That means you can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. For six weeks, you're stuck here. And I tell you, time and again, we get the best out from people. Those are the, the practical tips, how to pursue the game, the impossible. Finally, how do you think that the lab approach might look like right now on sabbatical? Using the example of you, know, you and mom wanting to yeah. figure out uh, you know, projects uh, yeah. to, to do together. We've been praying. Nan and I have been praying very hard. We do our Bible in one year, uh, daily devotion, praying for God to give us open doors for things that we ought to do together that will make a difference. There are quite a number of things that we have laid out there. One of them is this. Because we have, Nan and I have a lot of experience in handling your Kung Kung prior to his uh, demise passing on in his old age and now my mother-in-law as well and my sister I've also experienced <coughs> my mom and dad when my when your your dad uh, your tapu died of uh, Alzheimer's so because we have a lot of experience in dealing with all people why don't we think about bringing a community of people who are having the same struggle dealing with the elderly so maybe we'll gather a community of people just to exchange tips, how they cope with it, what are the lessons learned. Doing that would be a wonderful thing to do. That was one of the things that are being considered on the list of things that we might do That's good. and to bring people together because I think there are so many lonely people out there. They're struggling to cope with their elderly people in their homes. And, and they, they can need help from a community of others. So that's one or a few others so we are not really thinking about these options in this year of the one year we will discover which is the one we will do. We will try a couple of them in the meantime, but we are really finding this, the sabbatical period of the year to explore the opportunities of this nature. 
and that, that certainly is one of them on the list. I think that's a, that's a great place to, to end today's podcast. Um, next week, just following the kind of structure of your, of yeah. your book, and in fact, following the structure of the, the basic ethos uh, and a framework of how you run Pemandu Associates, next week, uh, we're going to talk about uh, anchoring on the true north. Maybe give uh, our listeners or viewers a bit of just a taster yeah, of what that, what that entails. Yeah. True north is really a very simple idea that if you want to go somewhere, if you don't even know where you're going, you are dead. So it's really setting the strategic direction. So the term we use is true north. You can't go aimlessly pursuing the game, the impossible. You got to put a stake in the ground. What is your true north? Exactly visualizing it. So that's what we'll talk next week. Look forward to unpacking that yeah. with you, Dad. Yeah. Okay. But I think this has been a good episode one. Very good. And to our our viewers, whoever you may be, maybe one viewer, maybe no viewer, uh, we hope you found this insightful, and we look forward to doing more of these. If not for you, then at least for ourselves. Thank you.